Hey, everybody. I am joined by the authors of the book, The Hate Next Store, The New Face of White Supremacy. We have Matt and Tawny Browning here. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for being my first interview of 2024. Oh, there you go. There we go. Let's I like that. Um, I'm, I'm glad, too. I'm glad, too. You, you guys, like I was saying before we started, well, we were recording, but before I before the part that i'm going to cut off or whatever uh, i was saying that you guys have been on other shows that i that i enjoyed listening to so it's a it's a it's good to be uh even more connected with my community via uh interview guests and it's just good to talk to uh the two of you because you are this is a little outside of the scope of what i usually talk about so it's going to be a bit challenging for me so you guys yeah, have to you, you guys left to grade me afterward well shoot i think you i think you're going to be surprised i think it it, it kind of goes along with the same thing that you're talking about well that's what i was that's what i was saying beforehand i have a couple questions that are going to be i think a little different than the others ask but um for my audience who might not be familiar with uh with you um matt how did you become interested in the subject matter i understand there's a pretty terrifying origin story here actually the subject matter of hate yes i was a police officer for 20 years and during my time, I worked undercover in white supremacist groups. But the, the reason why I, I went to the white supremacy was because uh, a skinhead tried to kill me one night, stuck a gun in my chest, and we ended up fighting over the gun. And uh, luckily, you know, when he stuck it in my chest, the, the barrel dislodged and he couldn't fire it. So we fought. And he went to jail. Uh, not exactly handy with the steel, as they say. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, that's the one time that I I had my gun, but I didn't use my gun, and he brought his gun to a, I guess he wanted a gunfight, and luckily I was able to, you know, wrestle and fight over the gun and won. You know, it made, it made it really personal, and the scary part about that is that he didn't stay, you know, he went to jail that night, but he didn't stay very long, and what was it, two weeks later? Two weeks later, the, the guy I fought ended up shooting a cop in the back. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different things and, and people we can blame and point fingers at for him even being out. But, uh, yeah, that was that was my first run in with uh, white supremacy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of police in the carceral state, but I feel like you put a gun in anybody's chest. You shouldn't be out of jail in two weeks. I don't care. I don't care who yeah. that other person is. Yeah, you, you shouldn't. He should have been in, in for a long time. Unfortunately. I, I mean, I would I. I I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert, but that seems like attempted murder to me. That was. It would be attempted murder of a police officer, and he should have been in, in for a while. But if you go back, and if we go back and research it, the reason why was the county didn't have the money to prosecute. Oh, my God. Oh. I mean, even with cops. So it just, yeah, that was, it made it really personal, and it made it, you know, if well, I'll do something you, about this, too. So Yeah, you come after me, guess what? You just opened up the door for me to research everything about you and the organizations you're with, and I'm coming after you. And since that time, we've been we've been blessed or lucky. We put 19 skinheads in prison for murder, attempted murder. So you know what? That one, that one incident that night up on that dark road was the start of something good. Yeah, I, I do think so. You know, look, we're we're fairly critical of law enforcement around here, but infiltrating extremist groups that have violent intent is one of the things we think that law enforcement should be doing because yeah. that is uh, especially like what you were doing is prevention. I mean, I know you said that you you guys ended up busting people who had um, you know committed murder, but if I just think that your work very likely prevented many more murders, so. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the skins I locked up, we we are actually we communicate back and forth now, even to this day. And he's he even said, you know what, Matt, if it wasn't for you, I don't know where how many people we would have killed, how many people we would have hurt. And so I'm glad you disrupted and put us all away where we belong. And it's you know what, I, I I'm just gonna have to tell you, I am one hundred percent against corruption in law enforcement. If you're a dirty cop, you need to go to jail. That's how I stand. I have been nothing but um, what well, I don't even know how to say it. I, I'm against corruption, but I am for law enforcement. I am for the work that we do, and I am for good cops. Yeah, well, that's maybe maybe another day we can uh, maybe another day we could have a debate about that. But that's not that's not what we're here for today. Um, and I think that the work that you did and it disrupting uh, violent mm -hmm. groups is a, a valid a very valid thing and i think law enforcement should be actually engaging in more of that at, oh yeah with everything going on 
Uh, have you done? We, we, should, we should be working to stop it. And, right. And prevention. and prevention is key. Proactive. Yeah. Pr- an ounce of prevention, pound of cure, all that. So oh, wow. previous to this, had you done any other kinds of undercover work? No. No, I, I, you know, I, am I, anybody can buy dope, you know, I didn't want to buy drugs. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. And how I kind of got thrown into this because the guy tried to kill me and, you know, that opened up the door to 13 plus years working undercover in various white supremacist groups, not just in Arizona, but throughout the United States and around the world. That's, man, that's good work. That's good work. Uh, Tawny, how did you become involved? Um, you know, I was kind of involved anyway, because he would come home and, you know, I, it was almost like he was detoxing sometimes when he'd come home because hate really does change the neural pathways in your brain. And I didn't know that I was just a kid trying to make sure I had the man that I married, you know, that he stayed with us. But, um, yeah, we, I, I was kind of involved like that, but one, one morning it was actually Christmas, the day after Christmas, our 4-H lamb. My kid's 4-H lamb was found on the back porch, um, slaughtered. And so that was also a very, really dramatic way that kind of got me really into, I needed, knew that I needed to get into these mind in the minds and the hearts of these men and then women as well to see what was the enemy really was. So the, the lamb that was, uh, sending a message or an attempt to send a message, uh, you had been somebody who had been prosecuted or something some, something in their group had been disrupted knew yeah. who you guys were and and did that and i didn't know where it came from i didn't really you know that wasn't i just knew that we needed to do something and that little protective mama bear came out in me and that was enough that was during the time when when we had people show up at the house um you know wanting to confront me uh, and and once you, you you need to understand you can you can mess with me when I'm at work I I mean it's 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 no holds bar you do what you want to do but when I'm home it's not it's not the same and and luckily you know Tawny Tawny wants to protect her kids wants to protect her family and that's what she did very very good very good so what was the nature of your first under uh, undercover operation in this field. Oh, in, in the white supremacy field? Yeah. Uh, it was it was a simple breakfast at Denny's with the head of the Arizona National Alliance and three of his buddies. You know, it was getting into this. The National Alliance was the first group I became a part of. And from that point, that broke into all different things. The Klan, Aryan Nations, World Church, the Creator. Um, you, know, you know, you'd learn about the war skins, the Volksfront, the Vinlanders. Hammer skins. I mean, the list is endless of the of the people that we began to associate just because I had breakfast with the National Alliance. Were you you? I mean, were you scared the first time you went to meet with some of these folks? No, I mean, nervous. Yeah, maybe a little bit nervous. Um, but the thing about hate is the people who hate they can sense that fear, and when they sense the fear, that that's they're going to really target on that. So you had to. I was lucky. I had two guys on my cover team that were a couple booths away from me. Um, we we sat and we talked for a while, and and I developed my backstory from that conversation. And and once you once that at first, it's like when you when you talk to a guest on your show, it's that first initial contact. It's like, OK, you know, then we relax and everything's good. That's a that's a that's actually a, a pretty good analogy there, especially. Yeah, yeah you, 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 you feel that adrenaline, you feel it. But then you say, oh, Matt's all right. You know, or my name wasn't Matt. My name is Pat, Patrick or Packy. You know, Patrick's an all right guy. And then it just went. Everything just started going from there. Uh, Tawny, how did you feel knowing that this was going to happen? You know, Matt's always been kind of our protector. And so I I really wasn't worried about it. I really didn't know a lot of what he was doing. I knew that he did a lot of crazy stuff at work. And it just started surprising me how quickly they embraced him, though, and that every meeting that he went to was at Denny's. So those were the kind of the things that like stood out to me was like, are these guys idiots? I mean, they don't even they're giving you all of these leadership roles and why are we always meeting at denny's yeah i it's just i think the denny's thing it might just be that it's everywhere and so if they were 
if somebody was trying to investigate, maybe they'd be like, well, it was at a Denny's. I mean, somebody might forget which Denny's it was. Not not you. That's your job is to document what, document yeah. what Denny's it's at. But somebody else yeah, who might have. No, oh, there's anything wrong with Denny's yeah. or, or like Denny's is involved in any of this. It's just that it was surprising <laughs> how every skinhead crew, it seemed like, wanted to be at Denny's. I'm yeah. going to actually start a conspiracy theory about this, that, that the Denny's <laughs> is involved. <laughs> Well, I, I think there was four of them throughout the valley that we always met at, and it was. And then when you were working across the country as well, it was just like meet yeah. at Denny's, and was, I developed a hatred of the moons over Miami. Oh, that's know? like one of the only good things at Denny's. I loved that, and then I ate it too much. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're if you want something good there, your options can be limited depending on which Denny's you're going to. Exactly. So when you once you got in. So people have this vision of what a white supremacist is. And I think mo one of the primary things is that it's a man. Were these groups predominantly men? Oh, man, it was a mixture. You, you, can't, have a, you can't have a group without the girls coming along, too. And, and the girls were, seemed to be more violent than the men. One of our homicides we worked, um, it was started, the, a fight was started by the females and then that hiked up the skins, the guys, and then they went and killed another person. And it was just, it, it's the women are, are, is a lot of the motivation, but also the women were some of my best sources. So it was, it was good that, that, you know, you know, yeah, they're chauvinist and yeah, they, they have this thing, but they still want their women there with them. And they're a bunch of babies, you know, they, they, they need shoulders to cry on and they need people to talk to away from the their buddy across from them. And so, yeah, there's, it's, there's a lot of girls there, but they call them birds. They're skin birds. And there'd be a mom bird and all her little birds were with her. And then they'd hook up with the skins and they would go from there. How were the women generally treated in, in these organizations? I've been told I'm not allowed to say it anymore. So I'm not going to say what it is, but they were treated. They they were treated the, the way that they wanted to be treated, huh. or the way that they thought that they should be treated. If you if you some of the some of the girls were, I mean, they're stand up girls. They they just were good people sucked into an organization that they had no idea that they're being part of. But then there are the other girls that had the swastika tattoos. Then they had the the hatred, just like the guys did, and they would go on hunting trips with the guys and jump out and beat minorities. You know, I got to tell you, some of the guys that I was um, that I was involved with and met, you know, they would tell me about times that they would date just what they called outside girls. And the girls had no idea what they were getting into until that sh shirt came off and the tattoos were seen, you know, the big swastikas and the war birds and stuff. I mean, until that shirt came off, they didn't even know what they were getting involved with. Well, you know, there are, you know, on a first date, there are things you do hold back. And I suppose if you're a Nazi, that might be one of the first ones, you, one of the yeah, things you hold back on your first date. <laughs> That's a third date conversation. <laughs> yeah. Love of Hitler should probably be held off on. Yeah. 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 You, you, you wait, you wait and you wait until you think they're sprung. Right. And yeah, this may sound like a dumb question. Um, did you run into uh, any queer people in these movements? Yes. It's not a dumb question at all, because when you, when you talk about, the, the the other side, you have your sharps, your sharpies, as we call them, which is your skinheads against racial prejudice. So within the sharps, you will have whites, blacks, Mexicans, Jews, gay, straight, whatever it is, they can all come together. They look exactly like a skinhead. They dress head to toe like a skin. They'll go to the same shows as the skins go to. And I tell you, I had some of these sharpies working for me at one time, and they are some violent, violent people. And um, they're just as bad as the skins are. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm from the Bay Area, and the the history of the punk scene in Berkeley is full of um, confrontation between the the sharps and and the skins. And, oh, uh, up there! I mean, you had Bash up there, and those guys were huge. Yeah, and I mean, I know some. I I know I know some guys who have seen some things. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So because I mean we. I'm I'm into punk rock and stuff, and so the the you know the way it's told from the the sharp side is that they ran the skins out of the Berkeley punk scene, and I'm sure you know I'm sure the history is far more complicated than that, and I haven't really done that much research on it. So. I think if you talk to any sharp, they ran the skins out of every scene. Yeah, yeah, because it's just that's the way the sharpies are, man. I mean, the sharpies are some violent people, and I don't doubt that they did it. They're 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 just nuts. 
Oh, and, yeah. and I mean, in Berkeley, they the, the the skins were probably outnumbered a yeah. great deal by the by the sharps and just regular people at punk shows. If some shit cracked off, they would yeah. certainly figure out. They might figure out who was who. And the punk rock scene does not like uh, white supremacists, actually. Oh no, they hate them. A lot of the shows that I've been to, they'll stop and until we they'll until the skins leave, they won't play anymore. Yeah. So it's, and I, that's a, I think that's a better response than uh, than uh, violence. But I, I mean, I also understand maybe the impulse, especially when pe- people are young. Well, you know, this was all young people. So and they, they you know, they, they felt like their space was being invaded. Yeah, we saw a lot of that. That's a lot of what I did was go to a lot of those shows. And Matt, Matt loves punk as well. And so I saw a lot of that as well. Ooh, maybe I'll send you guys some music by my, my friend's band after. Yes, oh, dude. dude, I can't, I can't get enough of old school punk. I can't, I, I just, I can't get it out of my system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my friend's band is a uh, head by it. They're a punk band, but the, the guy was like in the theater. And so there's a little bit of meatloaf in their punk rock. And so right. it's v- very cool. Very cool. Um, I'm wondering how in undercover work, you're a lot of times you're probably walking a bit of a razor's edge. How did you, how did you get involved and not end up hurting people or breaking, breaking, you know, committing felonies essentially? Uh, so that's a great question because a lot of people think that once you go into undercover work, you have free game to do whatever you want. And, and you don't, you know, you have to, you cannot have a crime committed in your presence. If you do, you got to act on it. And so what I would do is I would try to, to divert it you know if they're talking about it i try to change it or or say yeah let's talk about that later on or or something like that because if i gather the intel that you know skin a b and c are looking to do an armed robbery then as long if i get that overt movement to commit an armed robbery that's good enough for us arrest them you know if it so if we have skins driving around, you know, doing a hunting trip and we know they have weapons and and they're looking as soon as they pull up on that one minority to get ready to jump out, then we got them. And so that's what we did. We just would hit them before they would actually do the assault or something else. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. You know, just because you're, you know, the, the TV shows and movies portray this in a very, very different way. And yeah. um you know, if you start committing crimes or being a party to committing crimes, now you're just a criminal. Yeah. Now you have, and, and to be able to get that, I mean, you got to go, judges have to sign off on, on everything that you're doing. You know, you have to have special permission from certain people. And it's like, I, I, I wanted nothing. I wanted to stop the crimes from happening. I didn't want to participate or be there to watch. I wanted to stop it from happening. Well, and there were so many times. I mean, there was one night that it was um, just really close to our anniversary that he was his. I'll let you tell that. That's yeah, I, 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 I got a call one night. They wanted to hang out at a pool hall. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't want to because it was our anniversary. I, Tony and I want to go out, celebrate our anniversary. And so we go out, meet some friends at a restaurant. And sure enough, my phone goes off. And it was another agency calling me and saying, uh, your friends just killed a guy. And I would have been there. And so I leave Tani at the restaurant and I go and end up working this homicide for the next, you know, 12, 13 hours. And I mean, he really wanted to spend time with me. He w- it was about love that night and hate across the valley was happening. And from that, I mean, he he had nightmares. This is why I, I don't know that other people know the other side of this because he decided to stay with me. He knows he could have stopped that, at least in his heart. He thinks that. And so it caused nightmares and problems um, men, uh, mentally, and psychologically, with, which was nothing. I mean, he can't hold these guys' hands 24-7. But he knew that because of past experiences that he could have talked him down, and that may not have happened that night. Yeah, you can't, you can't be everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, I mean, it was your anniversary. You're supposed to go to dinner. And it does. You were talking about um, love versus hate. It seems like in, in, in this case, you know hate kind of won and that kind of sucks because it's like the one night that 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 some couples you know i know you guys have kids and sometimes the anniversary is like the one night where the kids aren't there you're at a nice restaurant might not even be a nice place it might just be a place that you have sentimental attachment to or whatever it is and then in this case you know these these motherfuckers like kind of kind of put a monkey wrench in that 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 really that really sucks well yeah and unfortunately it was just the start of many I mean, Christmas Eve, it happened again on Christmas Eve. They killed another guy. 
you know, and, and so, but that, that's why we made it important that our time together, Tani would come to, with me to a show or a gig. And then she'd say, well, now that we've done your stuff, can we go do something I want to do? And, you know, and that's how we try to balance it out. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm lucky because I had Tani that would help me balance the stuff out. There's a lot of undercovers, a lot of cops that don't have that. And, and that's where the problems start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Like I said, it's not like the movies. It's not like the movies. It's not, no. it's uh, some guys apparent when it is like the movies, those guys go down with the ship, I think, because they end up, you know, if it's dope, they end up doing the dope. If it's if exactly. any, a number of things, they end up just doing it because it's like, like you were saying this stuff, it doesn't matter kind of what kind of group it is. Like, like Tony was saying, it's going to, it's going to, in some ways kind of rewire your brain and make, yeah. and make some people kind of change what they think is acceptable and what they think is normal. Yeah. There's only two movies out there that are realistically close to what it's like. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, you got it. It re, brain getting rewired is jacked up. I mean, when you, when, when I found myself starting to listen to freaking bound for glory and drop kick more than I should have, or not drop kick, but bound for glory and screwdriver, you know, I, I, aggravated us all all the different hate bands that were out there it's it's like whoa time to pull back the reins a little bit and put on a social d or something else if i wanted that hype yeah yeah it's you know good that you're self-reflective in that way the one i've heard of of those is screwdriver because they're like kind of well known and i the first i, I don't want to i don't want to say they've they're good at marketing their their logo looks pretty cool and they're they're pretty good at marketing and i think they i think of i think they hit the internet pretty early and pretty hard in their in their journey too like a lot of a lot of white supremacists hit the internet they got the jump on everybody on the internet actually their music sucks i mean let's 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 say for what it is screwdriver they're they're musically they suck i know a lot of guys that 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 worked for screwdriver and were security and accountants for screwdriver and um but yeah, they were the first, but they, they hopped on the internet. They got the stuff out and that's magazines, magazines, and, media. and that, and that's what's going on now. I mean, that's, that's the resurgence of all this stuff is all because of online media or, or, you know, the, all these stupid online stuff. And it's just, it, it's, it's sad and it's unfortunate, you know, to stay up on what's going on, you got to dive into all these underground stuff and it's kind of, you know, messes with you. Yeah. And when it was our personal time and some of those, he had some of those, um, that music playing, I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> we gotta, we really do have to have a balance here. And I do need this man that I married to be the man that I married. Well, yeah. sounds like, uh, <clears throat> sounds like you did a, sounds like you did a bang up job there, Tony, of, uh, putting the brakes on when, when, when it was time. So. Well, I just knew what I wanted in my life and what I didn't and what I wanted for the kids and some of that stuff that was starting to happen and some of the mentality that was being um, talked about and which I'm grateful it was because then I was at least in his head to know what was going on. Um, you know, it's not okay. It's not okay in a family. It's not okay in our communities. It's just not okay. And, and Tony, you're right. Tony was good because something happened at work and I called her up and she goes, you're done. You're done. And from that day on, I didn't go back. Well, that was, was 20 was years in. And I knew, I knew, I never thought that I would say something like that. But I knew with what he was saying that we were done. Yeah. Well, after 20 years, yeah, you've done your time. You've, you know what I'm saying? And now it seems, now it seems like, you know, the next logical step is, is what y'all are doing now is sharing your experiences and, you know, trying to, trying to inform people about w what happened and you know for lack of a better way to talk about trying to trying to get the normies to sort of understand that this is out there and that it's like like it's the hate next door that you don't know how many houses away from you this might exist no matter where you live and no matter like what you think about your neighbors and your neighborhood and your homeowners association or whatever so that's i mean it's the logical next step because 20 years is a long time to do that I, it it was really like shocking to me that some of these guys were like teachers and some were um, car salesmen, doctors, and, accountants, and there was a TSA agent as well. Mm -hmm. It just was like, what, what? I just don't even, I mean, how? And so that was one reason we wanted to write the book is to say, look, you know, keep your eyes open, know what you're looking for. Cause if we didn't know what we were looking for, 
um, the, did, did, until we did know, like when we wrote the book, our agent said, look, you can't say that all these things started happening all at once, but it was like, but they did. Once our eyes were open to it, we saw it all around us. Well, you know, it's, it's like anything else. You don't know about it until you do. And then if you, if you dive into it, you're gonna, you're gonna see it. You're gonna see it everywhere. And there might be some ways in which when we dive into something like this, we over like oversample for it. I'm not quite the, sure the right way to say this, where we might see it some places where it isn't, but it doesn't seem like that's the two of you. I was going to say, that's not what happened. It was there and it was concrete there because I'm not, I'm all about love. I'm all about Disneyland. I'm all about, you know, the good, the good stuff in life. And, and it was there and it was ugly. And I didn't want it affecting people the way that I was seeing what Matt was seeing on the street. Yeah. The problem when I, when I got out, when I, when I retired, we didn't get out. We, we kept doing our thing. We kept doing some undercover stuff. I was contacted by different militia groups that wanted me to go down to the border you know, and, and, and even knowing if I told them I was a cop, they, they retired cop, they, they kind of pursued me even harder to go down there with them. And, and so it, it's the hate is on every different scale. And it's, it, it's, they're not as dumb as people think they are. They're not a bunch of knuckle dragging thugs and, and, and things like that. These are some smart, very intelligent people who are in the movement. And, and those are the ones we have to be aware of and concerned about. And, and hopefully by people reading the hate next door, you know, they can see that through our experience, you don't have to live this because we give solutions, we give identifiers, we give stories and experiences, but all that stuff can be said. but you know what, this is how we can combat it. We just didn't want this to be a book about some cool stories. We wanted solutions and, and actually we wanted to do what we're doing here and talk about it. And, and so people could understand. And so that they would talk about it and maybe figure out how how they can combat it in their own in their own lives and communities. Because Matt, when Matt started, he was like a brave young lion, and he said, "I'm going to eradicate hate," you know. And it's just now that he's wiser, he knows it's going to take all of us on all of our own levels. And you know, it's more of a harm reduction model than it is an eradication model because you can't eradicate this stuff. I don't yeah. think. I think people are people are hardwired is a weird way to talk about it but people people like their in group and don't like their out group and that's just how people are most people are i try to be less and less like that every day but uh, that that software is running inside of me just like everybody else and so it's just it's just a matter of maybe making your in group as large as possible so that it's a good like way that. to put it i like that so did you ever get made matt yes you did yeah, yeah. What happened was I was asked to go and talk to a closed door session at our Senate in Arizona about how hate is fueling the, the, the border issue in Arizona. And as I go there, well, it wasn't closed door. I mean, every media outlet showed up and, and, and next thing you know, right as I'm about to begin my presentation, um, walking through the door was the same knuckle as I met at Denny's years before. And so, from that time on, you know, in overnight, I, I went my whole career without getting a single complaint and and wake up the next morning. I got 17 complaints waiting for me with our internal affairs. I have death threats. I have all kinds of things. And so media attention like we had never seen. Yeah. And so that was the end. That was I thought that was the end of my undercover work. But you know what? I, I kept going and doing things. And, and I just went from. Your your street level skins, I just bounced it into your militias and your your other organizations, your national and international groups that you know try to bring awareness and teaching police and, and teaching communities of what to do. Cool. So here's here's where it's gonna get weird. Um okay. what role did conspiracy theories play in the groups that you infiltrated? No, QAnon. I mean, you, any, you, just any, even going back, you know, going back to the, I think you started in the late nineties, even going back then. Well, I mean, you can, you can go back to, to, I mean, before that you go back to the order with, with Robert Matthews, you can go back to Ruby Ridge with, and, and Waco and all these other things. Those are full of conspiracy theories that these guys were preaching and teaching. And, and I think what's going on with the conspiracy theories is that people are looking People who join these organizations are looking for something that's different. And if you put out a little piece of a conspiracy, 
people are going to latch on to it and then they're going to go down that rabbit hole. And once you go down that rabbit hole, you start associating with the people who have that same philosophy. And it's like what you said about your in group and your out group. Well, now their in group is being full of other conspiracy theorists. And, and I mean, what's the biggest conspiracy I think right now within the white supremacy movement is that, you know, the Jews are here to take over the world. The Jews are running in media. The Jews are the Jews, the Jews. Everything is about the Jews. But you know what? Every Jew I've met, and I've met quite a few, I look at me and go, that's such a crock of crap. I want to <laughs> live my life. I want to, I want to do this. But from, but from before Christ, the Jews were being persecuted by, by other nationalities, other, other governments, other countries. And so I think that right now is a huge conspiracy theory within the movement. You have, you know, if you go into the, and I, I know I'm rambling on a little bit here, but if you go into the the sovereign citizen movement, you know, the whole straw man or the, the money being the IRS creates an account for you when you're born that you can go and claim at any time. Every conspiracy theory these people spout is somehow they want it to better themselves. Not anybody else is about them. And so they will come up with something and, and then they'll act on it. And I mean, there's people dying over conspiracy theories. Yeah. The, the one thing you had mentioned, the in-group out-group thing, it's that the in-group knows the secret, right? And the normies don't. So we've got this special information. It could be anything from chemtrails to you know, absurd yeah. things like flat earth. Um, any conspiracy theory, we have this information and other people don't have it. So it gives people an answer sometimes to complicated questions about the world, but it also lets people feel like they're better than other people because they, they have the, they have the answer. Uh, We have the best way to put a conspiracy theory is the same as a religion. It's I I'm Catholic. I'm better than you because you're a Baptist or I have this truth from my church, which you don't preach at your church. And, and, And that's how, you know, that's, I, man, I think if you put religion in anything, you've just turbocharged the violence and if you add a conspiracy theory into anything, you've also turbocharged the, the violence. And I mean, that's different than, you know, people's local church might be doing good work and not doing any of that stuff. And, exactly. But it just depends. It depends. Like is for, because like what I say a lot of times about uh, religion is if like you, if I meet a religious person and I find out they go to church every Sunday, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to like that person. Yeah. Right. Because they're, they're like involved with their community. And like around here, there aren't, you know, those big tent revival fire and brimstone churches. And then, you know, and if, you know, if somebody doesn't, then I'm, you know, my, my skeptical eye opens a little bit because it, it's, it becomes more of a personal identity than about a community. And sometimes, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm just oversampled for that stuff. And sometimes (laughs) I'm just totally wrong. And they're just like, I just don't feel like going to church. It's on Sunday. I'm not going. There's a good football game on. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So we also talk about a lot of, uh, we talk a lot about Scientology, but I don't like the word cult so much. I like the word, I like to refer to them as uh, control and demand groups. Mm -hmm. And what you've described and what you're describing here, these operate like control and demand groups. And uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. I think the best person to talk about that is Tani, because Tani, Tani has been involved with a show called Escaping Polygamy and now The Secrets of Polygamy. And, and Tani has talked to more of these people that are, I'll, I'll use your words, that are part of these control and demand groups like the FLDS or the Kingstons, the AUB, whatever polygamous group out there. And, and so Tani is better to speak on that. Well, I, I just, I, it was shocking to me how much the white supremacist, the, Nas- the white nationalist movement actually kind of um, would merge and, and become very much the same kind of teachings that we were hearing among the pol- polygamous groups. Like, um, in the Kingston group, they're taught from the pulpit, you know, Hitler had the right idea. He just didn't do it with the priesthood or basically that means with God. So, you know, we're and then, you know, FLDS, we all know about Warren Jeffs or most of us have heard about him and his very radical ways of thinking about race. And it was just surprising how extremist groups actually they start thinking the same. They start merging together. It's almost like evil follows evil, dark follows dark, that kind of thing. And they're all looking for a leader. As soon as you have one person stand up and, and, and start teaching something that they can grab onto because they're desperately looking for something, whether you go to Jonestown or, 
or any of these other huge cult things. Uh, Charles Manson, I mean, he, he was a religious guy. He, he taught what, and they wanted to hear what he was saying. It's all, everybody's looking for a leader. And within the white supremacy movement, as soon as we have a leader, I guarantee this, as soon as we have somebody that stands up and is willing to go against law enforcement, federal government, and, and civil you know, companies that are out there fighting hate, like the ADL or SPLC or anybody else, then, then we're going to have a problem because everybody's going to flock to that person because now we have a spokesman. And, and that's how when it's these, these cults or these um, high, demand. high demand religions or, or secretive societies, they all have that one thing in common, and that's a very vocal leader. Right. And you know, I got to tell you, I'm not always so convinced that the very vocal leader believes his bola, his BS either. I really, I really don't know that they believe it, but they, just, they like the control, the money, that kind of stuff. That, that's what I always ask. Do you really believe this? Well, we have and, a, there's a concept in like online influencer spheres called audience capture. And I, people I talk about it like it's new, but like what you just said, Tawny, where the leader starts to ramp up the, turn up the volume on the rhetoric and they get a more um, intense response from the people involved in the, in the community that they're a part of. Well, they're going to keep doing that because that's the, the intense response, even if it's not money, maybe it's all an ego trip for them or whatever. And so, you know, people have talked about, you know, how like, you know, YouTube stars or whatever get captured by their audience. And I had somebody say, oh, this is a new phenomenon. I said, no, it's not. I'm like, you know, Jim Jones got captured by his audience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, look at look at Richard Spencer. What happened to Richard Spencer after Charlottesville? He went away, and yeah. he went away. He was he was making so much money, and he was doing so much for the the far right movement, the white nationalist movement. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh shoot, I can get in trouble for this. I'm gone. And 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 once he stepped away, you know, now that's when you have the bidding war of people who's going to step in to take his place. And religion's no different. Cults are no different. High demand religions are no different. They're all looking for somebody that is willing to stand up and take the heat when it comes. Yeah. And I like, like you had said on the uh, Did Nothing Wrong podcast, you were saying that uh, there doesn't seem to be somebody right now. There's pe a lot of people making pretend. Like you had mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, little Nicky Fuentes. We, we yeah. always call him little Nicky Fuentes. Because he's he's because his rhetoric, you know, he he would be very upset to be called little Nicky Fuentes, I think, and he's not the guy. Um, the, there just isn't the and outside of him, like Tucker Carlson ain't the guy. He's establishment. He's just playing a game, and so there. I, I think you're right. I don't think that there, there is somebody, or if there is, they haven't really yeah. gained any traction at this point. There's there's nobody willing to pick up a gun. And go against a government like David Koresh or or Robert Matthews or, or Richard Butler. All these big names from the 80s and 90s. You know, there's nobody. When when Tani was so instrumental in shutting down one of the world's largest, most violent skinhead crews. And it and, and once we got to the leader of that crew, he's like, shoot, I'm out. I don't, I don't, I don't want the feds coming after me. I don't well, need he'd this. He'd had enough of that. He'd had enough. He he wanted to raise his family and he wanted to work and build his business. But now until somebody stands up and, and, and I'll tell you, once that happens, I, I, I think we're going to be in a, in a world of hurt. There's just so much going on under the surface. There are lots of people that are vying, just nobody quite strong enough to do it. But that's why when they hear certain things and words in our politics, they're like, Oh, well maybe, maybe that's our leader. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. That's, that's it. That's a good point. As a, you know, a lot of times it's it's crazy because it used to be kind of dog whistly, but and it's I don't think it's just because I know more about this than I used to. I think people are more comfortable comfortable being open with like known rhetoric that that um, caters to these groups or that emboldens these groups. We wrote an op ed. Um, well, Matt wrote an op ed for the U USA Today um, that was published in last month, and the kind of things that we were seeing online in response to that op-ed were what I had only seen on a white nationalist website before. I was seeing the same stuff on Facebook and Instagram that I had only seen on, on the, on, on a alt type um, social media site before. And I thought, wow, we really have gone mainstream. You know, I'm just uh, like kind of shooting from the hip here, but do you, 
is there a way in which maybe the internet allowing everyone to go out there and just kind of pop off and maybe get go viral will make it harder for there to become a big leader in this movement? Interesting. I, I think the leader is going to come from a subgroup. I, I don't think the lead. I don't. I don't think the leaders even come out yet. You know, like you like little Nicky Fuentes. I mean, he's he's buddies with Trump, and he's he's it, Nick's going to get his, and it's when I don't know how I don't know, but he's going to outgrow it, and, and, and people are going to go somewhere else. The money's going to leave, and I think that's his driving thing right now is the money, um, and the fame and the glory that comes with being a a white nationalist, I guess. But you know, I, I think it's going to—it's got to be somebody who who comes from almost like that dark, malicious scene, who who is who has maybe a, a you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a profiler. I wish I was, but I think it, you know, if you're asking me, I think it's got to be somebody that has a backbone, that has seen violence, who has been through violence, who knows how to handle himself in violent situations. So whether it's a, a vet, a cop. It's somebody I don't know, but that's what we're going to be running into. Huh? I, if I, if you were to ask me who it would be, I would have guessed it would be some suit and tie motherfucker. Yeah. Those guys, those guys are almost like a dime a dozen, huh. you know, and, and because not, not, I'm not trying to tell you, no, you're wrong. That's well, not no, what that's, okay. that's okay. That's okay. It's just like, if, you dismiss it, I definitely think that will be part of it because you still have to have a face man and you still have to have something. If you look at groups like the Oath Keepers, what, what made the Oath Keepers the, what the Oath Keepers were. Was it Stuart Rhodes? You know, Stuart, who was Stuart Rhodes? You know, it was the people that stood behind him that were ex-military, ex-law enforcement, active duty, you know, Homeland Security, active duty federal governments, and active duty co local cops. Those are the driving force behind these movements because they're the ones with the training. They're the ones with the tactics. They're the ones that know how to use the weaponry and they can teach it. And the guys like Stuart Rhodes or Nick Fuentes or Richard Spencer, any of these guys, they're just they're uh, it's like it's like an 80s hair band, man. That's the front man. The true talent is the bassist or the guitarist. Right. They're you in know? it for the fame to be a, to be a name and a face to be. Exactly. Because they have longer hair than the guy playing the drums, you know, or he looks better in in spandex than the other guy. And, and that's what that's what a lot of this is. And within the white supremacy world. Um, at least from my experience, you know what? The guys that scare me the most are the guys that have the knowledge of how to use the weaponry and, and know how to speak and how to talk and can motivate others. And they're the ones that will be standing back, you know? It's like every riot has three guys out there trying to get other guys to jump in the riot, Absolutely. you know, promote the riot. I mean, that's military structure too, right? You, the command and control aren't right at the front because the command and control gets taken out. Now there's no communication. So, right. Right. It's just exactly. ta it's tactics. I mean, these are, these are not new tactics, right? <laughs> like this is like, I love that you keep saying that because it's not, nothing's new. Nothing's, yeah. nothing's new. Everything just changes in like sometimes purely aesthetic ways based on what's going on in society. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing, you know, they, even in music, we say you can't sing no song that ain't been sung before, right? Like, it's, yeah. a, it's the same idea. So you said that you, uh, after after you had stopped doing, like, on-the-ground undercover work, that you had consulted with uh, law enforcement. Uh, what do what do law enforcement agencies get wrong about this issue? And does it is it different, maybe, for local, state, and uh, federal authorities? I think it's different for all of them. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think it's different for all of them because all of them have their different priorities. On the federal side of it, the priority is international terrorism. You know, it's not domestic terrorism. It's not, you know, I, I've, I've worked cases where guys, militias go down to the border in Arizona and they shoot illegal immigrants coming across the border, shoot them, kill them, go down, steal their money or steal their, the drugs that they're hauling for the coyotes or the cartels and use half of the money for to fund what they're doing and give the other half the money to border patrol, make it look like they're doing something good for the country. So I, I think that, um, I think that everybody's priority is different and it's, it's understanding that, that, that this crap is real. It's, it's, we're not making this stuff up. It's like, why, why, a lot of people think the white supremacy is, is like you say, or not like you said, but is a conspiracy theory. No, it's not. There are people out here that will kill you 
because of the color of your skin, because of the religion that you practice. And, and in order to help law enforcement, they need to be trained in what to look for. The signs, the tattoos, the stickers, the t-shirts, the music. Okay, we got this show coming to town, and I can tell you what type of people are going to be there because I spent 13 years going to these shows. And I can tell you why I was attracted. And, and I think that's, that's the main thing. Is, is, it, but it's not just law enforcement. It's schools, it's, it's churches, it's the government, it's our families. Understand if somebody comes home and they have a, a 14 88 drawn on their notebook, it's not their favorite Arizona Cardinal number that's on there. That's 14 words by David Lane and 88's Heil Hitler. You need to address that stuff. Yeah, and I think a I lot think, of people don't see it. I think a lot of people don't see it because they don't want to look because it's like a very ugly place to look, right? Like, like you know, my parents know broadly what I do, but we don't have a lot of conversations about like the kinds of topics that I yeah. c- cover. Um, one, my mom wrote the book and she said, "Oh my gosh, I have no idea." Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an ugly place, but I do think. Unfortunately, you got to be, if you're in charge of any kind of organization, any kind of community group or whatever, you do have to be willing to look at the ugly parts of your community so that you can, you know, prevent them from getting a foothold in your organization. That's absolutely true. And um, I had mentioned law enforcement. Did you encounter other law enforcement with white supremacist views? Not former, but current. Uh, The short answer to that is yes. Yes. Well, I don't I don't want any, uh, we don't need any stories. You can't, help, you, can't, you can't help it because my, my, you know, I did all this work, went to all these meetings, went to all this stuff. Um, I confronted it at grocery stores or being, you know, all these different things by these skinheads. And I can always talk my way out of it. And I could always, you know, be their best friend later on. I see them at a show and they want to fight me. And then next thing you know, Tani's getting information from them at the bar. You know, there's all kinds of things we can do. But my biggest fear I had was going to a meeting, whether it's the clan, the alliance, creators, whatever it is, and seeing a guy across the room like, oh, crap, he's Phoenix PD. And he's here on his day off. There is no cover team with him. He's here because he believes this. Or there's Glendale, Peoria, you know, whatever agency there was, the FBI, whatever. And that was always my biggest fear. And I, I joined an organization And they were so excited that I joined this organization. And they said, you have to come to our meeting Saturday. We're having two police officers explain what they can do to you on a traffic stop and how you get out of things and and what to tell them and what not to say. And I'm going, really? Who? who?" And they told me the names. And I knew one of them because I worked with them. And the other guy was from a different agency. And these are all documented. So it's like you can say, oh, oh, but it's all now been documented that these guys were doing that. So it's just. It's it's part of it. It's it's disheartening. And it was hard to live through some of that, like even talking about it, because it's like you just kind of go, how is this even happening? Well, like anything else, it takes all kinds, I suppose. (sighs) (laughs) You know, yeah, it's, it's unfortunately when, when you get those when you get military law enforcement at whatever branch or level who associate with these groups. Now you're giving these groups the tactics that that the government has paid to teach these people, whether it's building searches, close quarter combat, sniper training, entry, infantry, cannon, explosives, IEDs, whatever it is, you're passing that information on to a a radical organization that uses it against us as police officers or military. And right. it pisses them off. And I mean, you, you know, when somebody retires, it's not like you can take, take that stuff out of their head, right? You can't, you can't, you can take, you can take all kinds of things from people, but you can't take what's in their head from them. So even if somebody's fired for, you know, a valid reason or whatever, well, they still got the training, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. I had a guy fired out of the Academy for, for his, his membership and membership and, um, associations with white supremacists and outlaw motorcycle gangs. And, you know, he came to my house, wanted to confront me about it. And, you know, he got my address from guys on the police department. And it, it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So I got, all um, those, for I got, all those, there's very few that actually are dirty. It's just for the ones that are, it's just, yeah. Slap in the face. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, 
most most the good thing about this is most people aren't white supremacists exactly. so you're you're exactly. gonna find unless you're in an explicitly white supremacist organization you're gonna just find a few you know you're right. gonna find them you're gonna find people that hold these views at, in you know tech work um you're gonna find these people that are that are plumbers contractors like you said teachers counselors you know uh, the post office you're going to find them they're they're just everywhere but thankfully most people most people don't hold these views but i do yeah. think that i do think that there's a, a large swath of people who are like ignorant to what's going on and then there's another group who kind of know what's going on but they're not willing to rock the boat at work or at their church or and you know in their friend group even if one of their friends is kind of popping off about about some kind of shit you know yeah that's why you have the guys that go out on their own and do things. Yep. So the one thing I wrote down uh, while we were talking, the last question I think I'm going to ask is one. So we watched uh, January 6th live on the stream. I knew something was going to crack off. Like I heard people talking about it. Like I'm, I have fake Facebook accounts that are doing some version of probably what you do online or you're, you get, invited to these fake Facebook groups or telegram is a fucking cesspool. But on January 6th, one thing they stole a door from the Capitol and we're the only people who have noticed that, which was a little odd. I wonder what happened to the door, but I don't think, you know, but w the other thing we noticed was that they, a lot of the people there, and I don't think all the people there were necessarily white supremacists, but I think that the people there were under the misguided impression that the Capitol police were on their side, that the Capitol police wanted to prevent the transition of power from the former president to the current president. And just, you know, I don't, I don't know if you have the answer, but do you have any ideas why they would have thought that the people tasked with defending the Capitol would have just been on their side? Oh, wait, you mean like the conspiracy theories that the, the Capitol police were against the government type thing? Well, no, we saw people that that's interesting too, actually. Uh, but I guess so. I guess we saw people, telling the Capitol Police, oh, you're on the same side as we are. We back the blue. And yeah, well, here's, here's what you got. to. Here's what it is. And, and, and it goes back to what we just talked about, is that a lot of the people that were there that were part of the main forming of all this stuff were Oath Keepers. Oath Keepers are, you know, former law enforcement, former military, current law enforcement and military. And, and so as a cop... You know, when I when like if I go to a concert and there's a cop working security, I can I can show my badge and he'll let me in for free, you know, because we hey, we're cops, you know, that type of thing. And I think that's what they were expecting there also, is that hey brother, you know, I'm here with you, brother, and I hate the word brother because number one, I'm not your freaking brother. And number two, it's it's not the truth. I don't support you and what you're doing. I support you if you're back at the park yelling and screaming with everybody else, having your protest and doing what you think. But as soon as you start assaulting police officers, stealing from police officers, breaking windows at the Capitol, kicking doors in at the Capitol, you have now crossed the line that your badge that you carry every day means nothing to me. And, and it should mean nothing to you either because you just violated every oath that you ever took. And I think... When we watch the films, because you're right, I watch the films. I, I've watched a lot of film when it when it revolves around January 6th, because I was I was looking for the Oath Keepers. I was looking for the Proud Boys. I was looking for the guys with the Totenkopf T-shirts or the tattoos of swastikas it, because they were there. So that's interesting because I was looking for the media influencers. I was like, where's Nikki Fuentes? Where's Baked Alaska? Where's Richard Spencer? Like, and Richard Spencer wasn't there. But no, I was looking was, for. Alaska was there. He was inside. He, yeah. I, I, we watched his live stream from inside. Yeah. yeah. We, but that's, that's interesting that we were both looking for different, like sort of different factions of the same same thing yeah. when we were watching the the footage I, I was i was looking for the the group serpentining up the steps and and holding on to their backs and and tapping and doing all this other yeah. stuff because that's all tactics right that's military or law enforcement which are you and they had the zip tie cuffs and they had all this stupid stuff on that they shouldn't have been there but they were there they went there they showed up in dc with that equipment which tells you that it was planned in advance yeah and, and that's and I think that 
maybe not so much the Capitol Police, but I think that in that case, federal law enforcement really dropped the ball. Because if I knew that what we saw, I I was some, somewhat shocked by what I saw, but it was by like individual things that I saw, not by the, I was like, I think I even said on our show the, the Sunday before, I'm like, these motherfuckers are going to storm the Capitol if they don't get what they want. And yeah. I may have said it like flippantly, but it's not like I didn't yeah. mean it. And if I had that inkling, I don't know why. I have no idea why federal law enforcement did not have that at the top of like their collective minds on that day. It was so crazy. I can tell you. It's, it's no different from Charlottesville. It's no different from anywhere else. Is that when, when you have somebody saying, if, if Matt Browning calls and says, guys, I'm hearing all this information and I'm telling, well, we'll just say the FBI. And I'm saying, I have this info, this info, and this info. They have to go back and confirm everything that I'm telling them through their own sources. And it takes too long. You can't do that. And so were the, were the Capitol Police part of this? No, they weren't. They were there to protect. But when, when you're being stormed and your ass is getting beaten, it's like, geez, man, just go through. Go do your little tour and leave the building. Well, you're going to want to save your, you, you don't, you don't, nobody goes to work and says, I'm, I want to die today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what happened is these, these poor Capitol police that were understaffed, undermanned, probably undertrained to handle this type of stuff. You know, the guards should have been there. The, the, where, like you said, where were the federal agencies that should have been there? Because they should have seen the same thing that you guys were seeing and with all the talk saying, online. Exactly. And I, you guys watched it. You saw what you saw. I just was horrified. And I can't believe that we're trying to pretend like that didn't happen. We all saw it. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is, this was the violent attempt to prevent the peaceful transition of power. You know, say what you say, what you want about any particular politician. If, yeah. if they win the election, they won the election. You can, there are remedies. They can be, a president can be impeached. They can be voted out next time. There are remedies and we live in, you know, it's a meme, but we live in a society and in a society, sometimes you have to accept that things don't shake out the way that you want them to, like when it comes to the government. And unless it's something so extreme that you need to overthrow the government, and that's like, there have been very few instances in history where an overthrow of the government has been like done for legitimate reasons you're just being a crybaby. You're just being a crybaby because you didn't get what you want. Yeah, and, and remember this, this is, this is really important that I think a lot of people, you, and we can under, we can, if we can understand this, then we can understand where we're headed. Um, when it comes to the politicians and elections, we, we have a base is already there. And that base last time elected Biden as the president. So what do you have to do to win this election? You got to go outside that base to a more extreme group and bring them in because then you're adding to the votes. Your base has now gotten bigger because you're getting new vote voters coming in. And that's what's going on now. If you go back and listen to some of these guys, I mean, I'm not going to give names and stuff, but if you listen to what they're saying, I mean, they're not they're not looking for me and Tiny to vote for them. They're looking for the extremes of the extreme. To come out to the polls and, and cast a vote and, for them. And me and you. Yeah, and us. And whatever their base is, plus the extremes of the extremes. Not not your proud boys, not your nationalists. But now they're looking for maybe some hardcore sovereigns or some hardcore freemen or constitutionalists who are going to who've never been to town since 1984. They're expecting them to come in masses and droves and vote for their party. And that's the scary part of where we're headed. And the, you know, I mean, the, the, the crazy thing is that the, if, if a political party was looking for more votes, they would want to tack toward moderates because there's a lot more moderate people. I mean, I am, you know, politically pretty far to the left, but like, as far as like, like disposition and like just on, on many, many issues around like how society is structured and how I want things to work, I'm pretty moderate and it would be, it would behoove a political party to go after somebody who's more moderate just because there's so many so goddamn many more of us who don't vote than extremists who don't vote i mean a lot of extremists don't vote but 
there's a lot more normies and I don't understand like why people wouldn't just go after the normies and try to appeal to the normies who aren't it's, voting. Cause there's just so many people who don't vote. It boggles my mind. Yeah. I, I, it, it, we're, I mean, our political views don't really matter. We're, well, our, we're very much not political people. I mean, I may, and we much more than we've ever been, but we've always been pretty centrist and just, you know, kind of leaned one way or the other on certain issues. But this is these aren't political issues these are what are happening this is and what's this, happening the stuff you're talking about doesn't just lean one way or the other no exactly <laughs> it's, it, it is what it is and matt will tell when he goes into law enforcement and he teaches law enforcement he's like you're not going to like what i say but these are facts and these are what have happened these aren't just my opinions and it's it's not political this is what's happening once once you say the words bloodline or pure bloodline you, you, I'm going there. You have just gone three steps outside of the norm of people that you're trying to get. Right. You're just, at some yeah, point, yeah. you can't just call that politics anymore. I think politics is the politics is a method by which we don't kill each other. Right. It, it's the it's the method by which we don't hurt each other when we disagree on how a society should be run. When you start talking that bloodline shit or. Just any yeah. kind of like, well, this group is out and needs to be eradicated or marginalized or exterminated. I don't really, I, I don't think that's politics. I think that you're abandoning uh, you're, you're, the politics you're, you're, of a civilized society at that point. And you're, that you're, is straight up with the very first where I talked to skinheads and said, teach me, you know, teach me what you know. That is one of the first things that came up was the bloodline stuff. And it's just, and that's, we see that in polygamous groups, the bloodline. You know, this it's a very scary, scary territory when we start talking that. If you go back in time four years and you start listening to the different things, um, you know, it used to be, yes, I'm a nationalist or we need to build the wall or we need to keep out the rapists and the, and the gangsters and the criminals. And, and that, that was the speech. Now it's we have to keep our bloodline pure. We have to do things like that. You, you know what? No. What you, was the you, actual quote? You just, you, that's straight out of Mein Kampf. I mean, it, it, there's no way. Hitler said it first. And when I didn't know Hitler said it, but I can I can name at least 10 different skinheads that taught me that. And not for nothing, this, you know, this is a pretty diverse country. I don't know how you, uh, what their, how you would even accomplish their version of purifying the bloodline. I live in you the can't. suburbs and it's just, it's just, there's just... I just you see can't. people that are different than me everywhere. So I don't even like th the only logical conclusion there is, you know, violence, some yeah. kind of, you know, removing somebody from their country where they live and sending them somewhere else is violent. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And so oh, like yeah. you the, to purify a society, you can't do that without violence. Yeah. And this is a great nation and we can't even have a lot of these conversations within our own families. So that that's why one reason we wanted to write the book is so that we could talk we could get families to talk, teachers to talk, coaches to talk, you know, that we can have these conversations. So maybe we can enlighten, we can be enlightened as a country um, and as a people. This is a, this is a great to... nation with really smart people. This, we don't need to be like this. We need to start somewhere. We need to start over. So who do we start with? Junior high, high school, you know, first two years of college, what, whatever it is. We need to, we need to, I, I just don't get it. How come in high school, all different races and nationalities can go to class together and play football together and play basketball together and, and win championships. But as soon as they step foot out of that high school and go to college, it's over. I, it, it doesn't make sense. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, it would be, I think it would be a, a tough sell for a high school to teach a class about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Just for fear of uh, basically pissing off the parents who don't want their kids learning about the, the, the work that you do. And in some ways, the work that I do, but you guys are more uh, narrowly focused on white supremacy. But I do think it would be it would be a bang up class if it was taught the right way. It would be so good for the students. The students might be able to talk to their parents a little bit about what's going on in class. I just don't know. I We've don't had some he, not to interrupt you, but oh, he's, he's, given, he's given several, several, um, several seminars. I don't know, to, or, you know, he's gone and talked to, to auditorium full of high school students. And it's been a really, really well received and very, and tell him about our, our high, our local high school coach. Yeah. I mean, our, we had our, we, we could, we love football in our house. And so our, one of our, our youngest son, he, he played football at the, uh, at the local high school. The first year, his freshman year, they were one and nine. They were horrible. 
Um, but they said, we're going to win a state championship our senior year. Come senior year, the coach got everybody together. There, there was Hispanics, there was white, there was black, there was Jews, there was Catholics, there was every, every, and a even couple, a Russian. couple, uh, yeah, Russian and some other, you know, whatevers. But they came together in a classroom and the coach said, you will sit down and you will learn everything you can about your teammate. Because when you step on that field, all this other stuff doesn't matter. You guys are brothers and you are on this field and you're teammates and you will play to win. And sure enough, I mean, they won 11 and 1, won the state championship. And they did it because the coach sat them down and said, you are a team. And that's what we need. We need teams. We don't need the left and the right. I, I'm so tired of hearing somebody say, my friends from across the aisle. No, no. These are your fellow Americans that we need to sit down with and talk about what's going on. The line of the moderate people is, is going away real quick, too quick. And we need to get back to the middle ground so we can at least have a conversation. What I love about the story he told is that it happened, you know, he was able to bring socioeconomic and um, all kinds of diverse people together for a common goal. And they won. He won um, coach, coach of the year yeah. last year, again this year. So if we can do it on our football teams, why can't we start doing this in our communities and, and in our nation? I don't think it's too simplistic I, to play with those. I think some of it may be that we're isolated. I think that people don't go do run and, you know, to do a pickup basketball game or it doesn't have to be sports, you know, just like things like it's, it's kind of a weird example, but like Toastmasters, those things are dying and that's where people would get together and learn how to like yeah. give public speeches. And it's just all these, all these institutions, all these community institutions are going away. And it's, it's funny because people thought TV was going to do it, but TV now used to be a thing too. Everybody would watch the same shows and they, they would chat about the same shows. Now there's so many options. People aren't watching the same shows. And so I think everybody's just getting fragmented. And so it just forms these little pockets on the internet. And I'm, you know, I'm guilty of forming a little pocket on the internet myself. I just hope that I'm, uh, you know, telling people good things and giving people good tools to, you know, analyze society and figure out when people are trying to mislead them for their own ends. But that doesn't mean I'm not part, you know, that I'm not doing it and that it hasn't happened to me too. That's and so I goal. think, I think, you know, community engagement, um, you know, a lot of young people used to run off and join the Peace Corps before, uh, before college. And, you know, that's not a thing people do anymore because they got a, the college is so damn expensive. If they're going to take a gap year, they might have to go work and save money to do that. Or, you know, or if you, you know, if you start late, then you feel like you're going to be a year behind on, on, you know, making money because you went off and, you know, saw the world, you know, if you have rich parents, I suppose you don't care, but most people, most people don't have rich parents. So yeah. I think that, you know, I think that just the sort of death of community is, is one of the problems and it, it is, you know, it's not just the internet, but it's certainly, certainly easy to get yourself in any kind of pocket on the internet. And that's why that's why we want community involvement. You know, the churches need to step up. The community leaders need to step up. Let's come together. Let's do let's do things as a community. And be, like the book's title, The Hate Next Door. You know, we were doing a TV show for A and E called Secrets of Polygamy. Things that are kept in the secret, they want them to be secret because they're doing hurtful, harmful things. So let's let's start stop hurting kids. Number one. Let's start building ourselves up as a community and let's start coming together so we know who our neighbors are. I mean, growing up, we would, you know, we, we you run the streets, but as soon as the street lights came on, you had to go in the house for dinner. It's just not like that anymore. And we need to have it like that. Yeah. We do need to look out for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll say that, like, since I moved to the Burbs, I lived in uh, South San Jose before. And now I live in the East Bay, but it, it was the Burbs. But when I lived in a denser area, I actually knew my neighbors. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, but it's because everybody like you have to know your neighbor. They live in the uh, the unit above you, and if if you know if they want to have a dinner party, you want them to tell you. You really want them to invite you. Maybe they're a good cook, but also you want their phone number. So if they're being a little loud or whatever, you can be like, hey, you know, I don't feel so, I'm sick today. You know, you you and it's it's just little stuff like that. That and when when you get out, you know, at least for me, when I got out into the burbs, like those things stopped being important, and it was like really hard to connect with. Uh, my community and it like the people around me and it felt a little bit alienating uh where i'm at now i'm actually making an active effort to do a little bit more of that i'm, I'm friends with um friends with the lady that runs the the new india bazaar around the way because i'm learning to cook some killer curry but there it's you, you know just, just just little stuff little stuff and it's but you know i think that we're we're getting atomized and i think that 
everything being sort of tailor made for individuals, be it, you know, just through something like Netflix, even where now you don't, well, you don't have to flip through the channels and you might not find something you might not otherwise watch, or you're in an, a Facebook group. Maybe it talks about crime in your community and there's only one perspective on the crime in your community. Oftentimes, a you know, a hyped up perspective about crime and uh, that nobody ever pops in to be like, well, here's the statistics and you live in a pretty safe fucking neighborhood, actually. Yeah, and that goes back to the conspiracy theories of the far right, of the, of the white supremacists. You know, the, the statistics that they have on all kinds of different things are so jacked up, but nobody, nobody will sit down with them and show them the truth about what's going on. And that's why we need to. I mean, nobody... It seems like nobody wants to sit down and talk to a guy with a swastika tattooed on his cheek. And maybe they shouldn't. Or a skinhead across his forehead. But those are the people who need to be talked to before the tattoos put on. You know, those are the ones who, who you can see the change happening, but you won't see it unless, number one, you know what you're looking for. And number two, you care. And number three, you know what to do to maybe make the make this person make a different turn in their life and, and that, that's exactly that's our goal. what that's exactly the kind of person that matt does seek out and and we've had success in helping them see a different way of of, of thinking and a diff, that there might be a better way well and I, I do think that a lot of these groups be it something like scientology or a white supremacist group will prey on people who feel alienated who feel anxious about their community their society not getting along with their family maybe maybe in the throes of uh you know substance abuse these are these are the people you know the the people that are doing the recruiting aren't dummies right they're you know there was uh, like there in the like 2009 through 2012 there was this big movement online of like sort of men's rights activists sort of and they were like mad that they couldn't get dates essentially right and it was you know usually because you know if you're, if you're mad at the world maybe people don't want to date you but the the white supremacist movement noticed that was a lot of men and a lot of white men and so they started yeah. showing up at those events and recruiting because they're not stupid I mean, they, proud. they know where to go fishing right <laughs> that's i mean it's, it's basically a proud boy recruitment party is all that is yeah you know the male chauvinist you know i you know women need to be in the kitchens and all this other stuff let's go out and drink beer and fight and and, and so yeah that's and but that's the type of stuff that you could see and you saw that and you could you could in your mind you could formulate okay this is what's going on and that's the reason one of the reasons why we wrote the book is we want everybody to be able to formulate in their minds 88 i know what that is oh my gosh there's a sharpie you know tattoo or there's a you know whatever the symbol is that they're looking at and they can know all right you know what kids 14 15 years old i'm going to talk to them right don't right. necessarily want my daughter to date him but I'm going to go talk to him. Our daughter was at the gas station the other night getting gas in her car. And she called, Dad, what does this tattoo mean? You know, and, and it's it's just awareness. It's knowing what's there. And then it's addressing what is there. And right. once, once okay. we're aware, I think we can have the conversations mm -hmm. and maybe make some changes and a difference. Right. Like if somebody was like, oh, I was born in 88. I'm like, well, then why doesn't your tattoo say 1988? yeah right. <laughs> if you want to if you want to do that and like the tattoo artist knows what they're doing when they put that on somebody too well and then, then and i mean that gets into a totally new thing that sanctioned tattoo parlors and sanctioned tattoos and all this other stuff yeah that you know is a different topic different show but yeah you just you, it's, it's awareness and and that's what it that's what it boils down to for me and for my family and especially for me and tani together is now that we're aware, now that we're trying to make a difference. Great. I've uh, really enjoyed talking to you, but before we, uh, before we put a fork in this, let's hear about this new A&E show. Saw you. Well, we've, we've started it. Um, we were working on it all last year. It's called The Secrets of Polygamy. And it goes, it delves, it's part of A&E's Secrets of franchise. And they've done a really good job in putting us under that umbrella. And Matt actually is one of our lead investigators, or he is the lead investigator. And he goes and talks to different people to learn more about polygamy. And it's been really fascinating. Some, some we were able to put on line on, on air and some of it, you know, um, is happening actual investigations that are happening right now because of some of this work. So it's very exciting. The big, the big thing about this that I, I want to say about the show is, is it airs every Monday night, um, for 10 weeks, but it, it you know what, don't mess with kids. And that's what a lot of these organizations are doing. And this isn't a spoiler alert or anything else. Do not jack with kids. 
And that's what's going on is that it, within these these fundamentalist cult secretive societies, polygamous organizations, these these poor girls are 12 years old and, and they're being forced to marry somebody who's in their 60s or 50s or 70s. And it's just sad and it's sick and wrong. And quit, do what you want in your house. I don't care. You're consenting adults. Do whatever it is you want to do. But as soon as you bring a kid into it, you've crossed that line and you've committed a felony. And it also like it splashes over on like you were saying consenting adults. So if you want to if you want to have multiple partners as a consenting adult, you go on with your bad self and you let your freak flag fly, and yeah. you you maybe even advocate for the rights of the people who are doing what you're doing. But then you a lot of times I think people who are in these kinds of relationships end up having to spend you know an un, an un, unreasonable amount of time explaining to people that like no 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 it's not like this it's not like this. Well, we're 35, 32 and 33 and we live together. Like leave, you, you gotta, you gotta stop painting us with this brush. And it just kind of sucks for people because like you said, it's, it's somebody's right. If they want to have multiple partners, it's, and. Well, the, but the, having the multiple partners is one thing, but having the multiple partners that they say is sanctions by God and they're married and, and a prophet of God has told them to do this and then bring kids into the world so they can build the kingdom. It's the kids who suffer. And I've seen it over and over and it's, over. It's just horrible. Um, even if intellectually I don't like it, I've seen that it's the kids that suffer in these, in these kind of situations. And, you know, like we said before, this comes down to control and demand. These are control and demand groups. And it's one thing, again, if you're recruiting adults, I suppose, into a control and demand group okay. and using persuasion to get them to join, that's bad enough, right? But now yeah, you have kids that don't have a choice. And that's, yeah. that's a far, far more terrifying. Yeah. Well, Matt and Tawny, this is, this has been great. Um, thank you for being my first interview guests of the year. Hey. And, uh, if you, if you guys ever need anything, I don't know what, what I have to offer, but if you ever need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be happy to help you guys out. If you ever, I don't know if there's yeah, some sure. skill set I have that you could, could benefit Same from. With you. Yeah, Same with you. Sure. Whatever we can help you with, please let us know. Okay, great. This has been, uh, Matt and Tawny Browning. The book is the hate next door. And uh, make sure to check out the new A&E show.